Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Incarnation Lutheran Church. If you're worshiping with us online, thanks for being here. It's good to have you as a part of our church without walls. My name is Joel Vanderwall, one of the pastors here. Later on in the service, Pastor Kai Nielsen will be delivering our message. Throughout the month of August, we're studying the book of Ephesians, and so we'll get a chance to hear more uh, about that in-depth study of that book. I invite you now to please stand in body or in spirit and join me in our opening confession. This is based off of Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. God chose us in Christ and destined us to be beloved children. God's grace is freely given to all. God's love knows no boundaries. Forgive us, O God, when we make your gift of grace a demand and burden, and we dismiss and diminish the power of your love rather than experience it and express it to others, and when we neglect to see others as you see us. Let us pause for a moment of silent reflection and meditation. In the risen Christ, we have the possibility of renewal and redemption. Receive his forgiving love. Rejoice in his lavish grace for you and for all. Thanks be to God. Let's sing together our opening hymn.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. By your grace, O God, we are made whole in our relationships with you, with ourselves, and with others. Strengthen us in our inner being so we may boldly and courageously do the work of grace and love that you created for us from the beginning of the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good to see all of you here in worship. Uh, great to see all those who are gathering with us online this morning. Uh, we're going to continue our work through the letter of Ephesians. So remember, Paul uh, was one of the leading missionary apostles, the people sent out by Christ uh, to do his work to spread the good news of Christ's resurrection. Uh, he started many congregations around the Mediterranean, and what he would do in response then is after he would leave, he would often write letters back to them as sources of encouragement, uh, sometimes as sources of challenge, uh, but mostly just to kind of keep them grounded in what the faith was all about. So we're looking at the letter to the Ephesians today, and last time we looked at uh, a big question, how was it that the Apostle Paul moved from being a persecutor of the church to a proclaimer of the eternal Christ. How is that possible? Paul moved from being a persecutor of the early church to being a proclaimer of the eternal Christ. As we talked about it, there were a couple of concepts that seemed to be the transformative principles that Paul connected himself with, and those two concepts were God's grace, which is God's favor, freely given, undeserved, and God's love. So this past week, I looked at the rest of the book of the Ephesians, and I found out how many times Paul actually references those two words. And uh, Paul uses the word about God's grace more than eight times throughout the letter to the Ephesians. And he uses the word for love more than 12 times. 20 times in six chapters, Paul references God's grace and love as the transformative way for him to experience this new life. So love, as you know, or may know in Greek, uh, takes many different forms, all right, depending on the word that's used. And so if they use the word eros, it would mean more of an erotic love. If they use the word philios, it would mean more neighborly love or brotherly, sisterly love. But what's used by Paul more than 12 times in the book of Ephesians is agape. And agape is the love of God. The love we know in God, the love we've experienced in God, the love that we have a chance to mirror 
in our lives in the world. Twelve times, every time love is spoken of, it's the love of God that we have a chance to experience and then express. So the transformative work, the generative work that Paul experienced was God's grace, God's unearned love and favor, and God's love, which is the gift that began the world and then gave him a chance to participate more fully and freely in his life. So that's chapter one. That was all setting up that. Chapter two, we begin with these words. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to hit about ten verses, but we're just going to kind of walk slowly through many of them. I'll pause along the way. So, Paul begins this in chapter 2. You were dead through your trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among you, those who are disobedient. Boom. Gut punch. Grace and love on one hand, but let me talk to you about what the world is right now. Interesting imagery to start with. You were dead through your trespasses. Have you ever heard someone use the phrase, uh, or have you used it yourself? You are dead to me. You are dead to me. So what does that mean when we say that? It means somehow there was was either a precipitating incident so grave that we can't see ourselves being in relationship with that particular person anymore, or there was an accumulation of things that didn't work over time where finally the person just threw up their arms and said, we're done, you are dead to me. That's kind of the imagery that's happening here. There's so much going on, whether there are big things that people are doing to violate the the goodness and the love of God, or things that just accumulate over and over and over God. Paul's just saying, all right, you're dead to me, right? That's how we kind of see ourselves in relationship with one another. But it'll come back. All of us at once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires and fleshes and senses, and we were by nature, and here's the word I want to look at, children of wrath like everyone else. So Paul's just kind of locating where we were in the experience prior to experience the love and grace of Christ, right? He's he's trying to locate us, right? So (laughs) the imagery of children of wrath. First thing I thought of when I read those words, have you ever been in the grocery aisle and had a young kid, right, and it's generally the cereal aisle, absolutely lose it, right? They just go freaky because they don't get what they want. So again, it's often in the cereal aisle, and you can imagine the conversation, and the parents saying something like, hey, let's get some cereal. Uh, How about some healthy, organic cereal that doesn't taste very good, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And the kids are like, forget it, man. I want Cocoa Puffs. I want Lucky Charms which is, of course, my go-to's when I was young. But, and there's an absolute meltdown that happens. You cannot get the kid to even move at the times because they are just frozen in their fury. Children of wrath. Living intentionally in the moment, purposefully in opposition in that relationship. So what are the kind of... uh, ways that we might do that in a little bit more subtle ways, but we're participating in kind of the language, the imagery of being children of wrath. Well, you could use kind of use the parallel of selfishness, right? Isn't that kind of moment of the kid in the grocery aisle about, hey, it's all about me? Well, how often does that become the case for us? Where we live in such a ways when really we're out for our own best interest. We're living as children of wrath. How about greed? How often do we participate in greed, which means that we've been given all of this, who we are, as a gift from God, and yet what we say to ourselves is actually it's my gift that I earned that I can choose to do with it what I want to do with it. We're living in small ways as children of wrath, in opposition, intentional opposition to the goodness of God. A little bit later in chapter 2, we won't get to it today, but Paul uses the imagery of of the dividing wall, right? We put up dividing walls between people. And so for that, Paul, it was between two aspects of of the religious groups, one that he said was getting it right and one that he said was getting it wrong, right? But how often do we do that? 
whether it's between religious groups of experiences, whether it's between ethnicities, whether it's between people of different orientations, we continue to build dividing walls and we say us versus them. Every time we do it, we're living a little bit as children of wrath. How about when we just neglect the fact that there are people who desperately need to experience the same kind of equity that, most of, that many other people in our world experience? We live as children of wrath. Now, you might say, that's kind of harsh language, isn't it? Children of wrath, disobedience, dead to our trespasses. Well, I say Paul's using that kind of language, stark language, for two reasons. One, it's real. That's how people were living. That's how people continue to choose to live, don't they, in times. The second thing is this. You can't start something new and have it sound just kind of like everything else that's around. So I'm going to say that Paul intentionally uses very stark, dramatic language in order for him to be able to get the message across that this is a very new thing that we can experience. Let me give you a quick example. I was at a uh, local restaurant in Shoreview, which is new, I think, within the last year. And I ended up having a conversation with uh, the owner. And so I asked the question, you know, why did you think about starting this particular restaurant? And they said this, I've lived in the Shoreview area for about 12 years, and the northeast quadrant of of, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul is just an absolute food desert. I mean, unless you want a burger somewhere, there's nothing good out there right now. Think, listen to like the stark language, right? So I just would, wanted to create something that used good ingredients, that used healthy ingredients, and mixtures that were creative that were unlike anything else that was around here. You see what she's doing? She's not saying, you know, I was thinking about opening a restaurant, and it's basically the same as most of the other ones. It's just a little different, right? We've got a couple different things on the menu. No, nobody's going to go to that restaurant, right? Nobody's going to go to that restaurant. You want to make a stark contrast between what's out there and the experience that you can have when you go to that particular place. That's what I think Paul was doing. One, he was being very honest with where people were these days. We were living as children of wrath, as greedy, as selfish people, not seeking justice for uh, the sake of others. But there was also, he wanted to be able to say, this is unlike the other communities of faith around here. In the grace and love of God, you will experience something so beautiful and so radically transformative that you'll want to be able to give yourself over to it. That's the kind of work that was happening for Paul at this point. So Paul sets it up. I mean, he just basically paints a picture of where the people are at in very stark language. And then, and this is the first text you can put up there, the next word is but. Now, it is a very small word that has massive implication. It's a very small word that has massive implication. Remember, Paul's just setting this up. Here's the world that we live in right now. But, and, and, and he's, you know, left to itself, basically. It said, you know, you know where it's going to go. But, says Paul, God, who is rich in mercy, mercy is undeserved love, all right? So people of wrath, people who are disobedient, like it's undeserved. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, What's the motivating factor for God? God has chosen to interact with this world in love for love. It's like the heart of God. When 1 John talks about the nature of God being love, that's what Paul is talking about here. That's the deep sense of who God is and how God wants to interact with this world. Out of the, this great love with which he loved us, here's what he did. Even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. Even when we were dead. I often ask the question, what didn't Paul say? You know, just sort of help me think through what's the impact of it. And so what Paul didn't say is this. Um, Paul didn't say, uh, God loved us, poured love out for us once we got our act together. Didn't say that. Paul didn't say, you're dead to me. God never said that. 
even when we were dead in our trespasses, out of the great love with which God has for us and for all people, God showed us what that looked like in the person of Jesus. It's, it'll change your life. It will change your life. If you enter into that space of how deeply loved you are, no matter what. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places so that in the ages to come, listen to this language again, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us. Think about all the ways, like I pointed out last week and this week, that Jesus and God's love is described. Uh, there's goodwill, there's a good pleasure of his will. This was last uh, week. Glorious grace, freely bestowed on us, lavish grace. There is immeasurable riches of kindness that God has toward us. Is that the God that you trust in? That somehow no matter what's happening in your life, no matter where you've been up to this point, no matter where you're going to venture to in this upcoming, do you have a sense that that's the God who has brought you into life and has given you a, a, a chance to live freely and fully in that love. And then he goes on, and this is a, for, for Lutherans, it's a super familiar uh, phrase. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Let me parse out a couple of those words. Saved, uh, important word. In big parts of our Christian tradition, when somebody talks about being saved, what do they mean? Right? It means that they've had, generally had some kind of an experience, that they've said the prayer, that they now believe that they are with, going, going to be with God in eternity. They've been saved, okay? That's not necessarily what the word means here. If you look at the original text, yes, saved has some sense of, of deliverance, right? Think about people being taken from slavery of freedom into the promised land. There's a delivering that happens there. But it has also more to do with this, with healing, the Greek word is sozo, which is about healing. It's about mending. It's about building a relationship. It's about being made whole. So maybe what's happening is Jesus came to show us that we can actually be made whole in our relationship with God. We don't have to live in opposition to that. We don't have to live in fear about it. We don't have to feel like we need to be coerced to follow along. We've actually, there's a healing and there's a mending that's happening ongoing as we continue to invest ourselves in the graciousness and in the love of this God. And grace, important word. Uh, Dallas Willard, one of my favorite teachers, said this about grace. Grace is opposed to earning. You're not earning anything, right? But it's not opposed to effort. Which means that we can do something. We can respond. We can be active in this process of working out what God has for us. So let me go on. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a pure gift from God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. Uh, one of the things that's tripped up Lutherans, I think, over the years is that uh, we've, we've got so adamant about not having our works prove anything toward God that when someone says, well, what should you do? Say, oh, we don't have to do anything. And you go, well, your life looks like that. <laughs> you know? But that's not the point. The point isn't not to do anything, right? The point is you don't have to do anything to earn it or deserve it because it's already given to you as a gift. So now what are you going to do with it? And then here's the phrase at the end that I love. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Look at that. God's not opposed to good works. In fact, you've been made by God for good works, that they've been prepared beforehand to simply be our way of life, simply be our way of life. We, don't have, we should get to the point where we don't even like even think about it. This is just the way that we respond to the world. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to simply be our way of life. So last week I was reading an article uh, in Time magazine and um, it's about a Scottish philosopher, William McCaskill, I think is, was his name. And he's begun this thing called effective altruism. 
And what he believes is that we can figure out how to do the most good in this world. There's ways for us to help figure out how can we possibly do the most good in this world. And so he began, he said that beginning of the article says he was in a grocery store. So twice in one sermon, we're in the grocery store in the cereal aisle. Think about that. Twice in a sermon. Um, he's in a grocery store and he's looking at the cereal. And he says to himself this, if I chose to buy a cheaper cereal for the rest of my life, I wonder how much money I would save. And with that money I saved, I wonder what good I could do in the world. It was just a thought experiment for him that began to prompt him to say that we can make intentional, conscious choices with our lives to do the most good. Now, I don't know exactly how he defines good, you know, but in some ways for me that that's not the point as much as think about the impulse, the desire, the longing, the piece of just the natural sense that we can be people who do the most good in this world. One more quick story. I saw this, uh, uh, posted this last week. It was about Margaret Mead, who's an anthropologist. And uh, Margaret Mead uh, was in class one time, and, and um, someone asked her the question, uh, what were the key things that, that you, that was you, in your research, you understood that civilization was really beginning? Like, what were the, the key events that happened along the way that civilization and culture was really taking hold? And the person talked later, and they were assuming uh, that there'd be things like, well, the the, the grinding stone, right? Because they, they figured out how to take wheat and like grind it up and make bread and make, you know, other things so that we can survive with one another. Or the fishing hook, you like an industry. They, they live along the river so we can provide for ourselves and we can learn how to, to eat. They thought there were, those would be the kind of things. And she responded with this. Uh, I think it was the broken and healed femur bone that we found. People are like, what? What are you talking about? And she said this, in the animal world, if you break your leg, you're done. Predators will come along, you will not be able to escape. When you break your leg, you are done. But if you find a broken and healed femur bone, that means that somebody else had to come along and help you and take care of you and work with you and provide for your needs in the best way that they could so you could actually heal, so that you could get to the place where you could enter back into the world more fully. A healed femur bone, and she said this at the end. I love this little phrase. Put that up there. Helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. Helping someone else through difficulty is the core of who we are. This past month has been uh, a lot for me with some external uh, family things and for a number of families in this community. And I don't think for a while I've gotten the sense of how deeply important that little phrase is. Helping each other out through difficulty is where civilization starts. That's who we are. Friends, I just want to remind you that it was the grace and the love of Christ that came into the Apostles Paul life and he moved from a, a persecutor of the church to a proclaimer of the eternal Christ. And in that proclamation of the eternal Christ was a, a living, a way of living in this world that he describes with those, that last verse that we looked at. For we are made in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, to do good things, which God has prepared, prepared beforehand for us to simply be our way of life. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing.
Together we profess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Holy and loving God, we thank you for the gift of faith worked within us by your Holy Spirit. We thank you for having called us to yourself, for consecrating us to your service, for having us set apart to the sacred ministry of prayer. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, what, we are what you have made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. And so we ask, Lord God, that you would strengthen us this day by your words of promise, by the gift of holy communion, by the support and love of those gathered here to be your hands and feet in the world, performing good works for your glory. We pray a special blessing on the 50 middle schoolers and high schoolers who will be gathering together every day next week to serve our community through summer stretch. Bless our time together as we seek to bless others with your boundless love and grace. Lord Jesus, the great physician, the healer of our bodies and souls. We thank you for all the ways you have healed us in the past, for the gift of modern medicine that helps us to mend our bodies when we are broken and sick. We thank you for doctors and nurses who dedicate their lives to alleviating suffering and helping to heal others. We pray for all those on our prayer concerns list, confident that you know what they need most. We pray for all in illness and pain, weary of the day and fearful of the night. Grant healing, and at all times through faith, the gift of your indwelling peace. Be especially with those in our community who recently lost loved ones. Comfort them in their grief and grant them your peace that is beyond all understanding. In the silence now, we lift up to you the concerns of our own hearts. Thank you, Jesus, for always being attentive to our prayers, ready to listen and to respond. And as we continue our worship now, fill us with yourself, Holy Spirit. As we turn to the sacrament of Holy Communion, allow us to encounter your very self. As we give of our offerings, be with us as we enter into that rhythm of generosity and grace. As we sing, lift us ever higher to yourself. Be glorified in all that we say and sing and do. We pray all this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let us now prepare to receive this gift of Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right in our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat of it, do so remembering me. In the same manner, after they had eaten supper, Jesus took the cup, and he blessed it, saying, This cup is a new covenant shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins for all people. As often as you drink of it, do so remembering me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Here at Incarnation, we believe that this is Christ's table, and so he is the host of this meal. And so we invite all to come and to participate, uh, to be joined in that grace and love that Christ offers to us here. So come to this table. If you haven't been for a while, come to this table. If you come often, this is for you. As you come forward, you will be given a wafer, uh, and we invite you to dip that into the cup. In the cup, there are two different liquids. The dark-colored liquid is wine. The light-colored liquid is grape juice. If you have need for a gluten-free wafer, just indicate that to your server, and they will be happy to give you one. Also, if you prefer to have one of the prepackaged communion cups as you come forward, just know that those are available for you as well. Pick one of those up and still hear those words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And we know that we worship a generous God, a God who loves us unconditionally, and out of response to that generosity, uh, we have an opportunity to give of our own gifts and tithes, and so there's offering plates available as well as you come forward. Come, for all is now ready. I'd like to invite the communion servers and the ushers to come forward.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Just a few uh, next steps and things for us to celebrate. I'm not sure if it's been mentioned yet, um, but last month, throughout the month of July, we had our Tons of Love food campaign for Ralph Reeder Food Shelf, and we were able to raise over $20,000 and bring in 1,200 pounds of food. So thank you so much for your generosity. We so greatly appreciate it. Uh, as you know, during these summer months, it's really hard on families as children are not able to receive some of that lunch assistance that they have at school or that breakfast assistance. So thank you so much for that impact to our, to our community. Um, some things coming up. September 4th, that's Labor Day weekend. There will only be one service at 10 a.m. Uh, bring a lawn chair or blanket that will be outside. There will be a pre-recorded service available for those who want to worship online uh, that weekend. So please come join us 10 a.m. just outside door 6 there. And then the following week on September 11th, we'll be having our Celebration Sunday and Backpack Sunday. So please come to that. Our first service starts at 9 o'clock. There's going to be bounce houses, a climbing wall, food trucks, all kinds of things outside. During the service itself, we're going to be celebrating our 60th anniversary as a congregation. Uh, so a chance just to celebrate our community together. And we'll also be blessing all of our kids as they head off to school. So please come for that. One of the things uh, that we'll need help with is during that day, we're going to be doing a service project. Since it's our birthday, we want to celebrate other people's birthdays. So we're going to help out Solid Ground by creating birthday bags. So located out in the atrium, there's a table there, and you can grab one of these cards for some birthday bag items uh, to celebrate and to help other families be able to celebrate birthdays. Uh, helping out our Solid Ground ministry partner. So please take some time to visit the table uh, after the service and grab one of those cards. Um, also, we're looking for historical pictures and documents. So if you happen to have any of those of the last 60 years or the last 20 years or the last five, please bring those in uh, so that we can create a timeline of all the things that we've been able to do as a congregation. And finally, fall programming has started for children, youth, and family ministries. And so if you visit our church website, there's an easy way for you to register for uh, those upcoming fall programming things that will be happening. Those are all my announcements. I invite you now to please stand in body or in spirit and join me in our closing hymn.
Thanks again to Laura, our trumpet player, and our summer choir. Thank you for leading us in worship today. We so greatly appreciate it. Go with this sending. Rooted and grounded in God's lavish grace and love, go now and co-create a more gracious and loving world. Thanks be to God. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week. Thank you.